leaders on burning issues. This is important for three reasons. First, it makes our program relevant to the ongoing national development. Second, it exposes our graduate students to the ideas of policy makers who are also in the front line of decision making in topical issues. And thirdly, it enables us to test our theories with empirical realities. It is within this context, on behalf of the management team, the faculty, the staff, the guests who are all here, that I am pleased Welcome, Her Excellency Chief Joel Howard Taylor, Vice President of the Republic of Liberia, who is also a renowned champion on gender, on women health, on educational development, to address us and this thing, a topic of gender, health, and education in Liberia. Why do we select this topic? We selected this thing or this subject because it is an increasing debate in national development. But not only that, it is pertinent to the sustainable development goals, especially goals three, four, and five. Goals three that talks about on education, and of course, goal five that talks about achieving gender equality and empowering women and children. I am therefore confident that our guest speaker, you will learn a lot from her. 
Why? Because she has a vast fountain of knowledge and experience. Is she a citizen or devoted Christian, the standard bearer of the National Patriotic Party, the Vice President of the Republic of Liberia, the President of the Liberian Senate, a, a distinguished and dedicated public servant, a patriotic citizen, and a positive role model. I thank you.
you have a quicker time to fulfill those goals and aspirations. And if I will tell you that two people work walking together, if one slips and falls, the other one can lift them up. If one is cold, the other one can warm them. Just a small, simple example of what the gender factor is. Today we'll be looking at the gender factor on health, education, politics, and development. As we begin, let's just look at a few of the words. Because you will find out that as you look at these words, a lot of things come to your mind. But I've chosen a few that should set the stage for our discussions this evening. Originally, the word gender described just male and female. And the socio-economic and cultural differences and assigned roles between the two. However, Times have changed, and some of the names you will hear describing gender are way beyond what I can even imagine. So including male and female, we have transgender people, someone whose gender identity is different from the way they were born. We have gender neutral people, some of them who feel they are neither male or female, can you imagine? I have to talk about it. We have non-binary gender people who refuse to identify themselves as either male or female. We have cisgender, you have all kinds of genders, gender queer, two spirits. And the two spirit one is, 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 is important, a person who carries the gifts of both male and female organs. I think they're called in my food diets. And so the issue of gender and how people describe themselves and go on and on and on. I actually found about 68 different gender descriptions as we open up our world for more inclusion and participation. But let's look at health. It is a person's mental or physical condition. Some components are social health, physical health, emotional health, and the list goes on and on. I chose as the definition for education as a process of acquiring knowledge to study, training or imparting knowledge by way of instructions or other practical procedures. Gender identity, and when you fill out forms today in many places, they will ask you what is your gender. And sometimes it says male, female, or other. Because I think all of the other hundreds descriptions fall into other. But the gender identity is how a person feels and who they know themselves to be. That is a mental state of mind. And someone might be born male or female and determine maybe they are a cow or something else. There are some people who believe that though they are in a physical body, they are something else. Politics. It's a set of activities associated with the governance of a nation and it involves making decisions that affect all of the members. Another word for reflection is gender relations. It is a specific mechanism whereby different cultures determine the functions and responsibilities of each sex and how access to material or financial resources and even power are divided. Sex has been the same. The permanent biological characteristics come to individuals in all societies and cultures. Next word is gender differences. The gender differences are social contracts inculcated on the basis of specific perceptions of the physical differences, taste, tendencies, and capabilities of both men and women. And then my favorite word, gender equity, is a mechanism whereby access and allocation to resources and opportunities for social and economic advancement are fairly distributed for all. And this is the crux of the matter. In a regular or normal situation or normal country, governments, civil society,
excited groupings, different organizations strive to put in place a framework where all of the resources are available to all. Africa, however, is behind in this index. The issue of gender disparities and the need for greater inclusiveness began as a simple formula to end inequalities, reduce marginalization, and accelerate development. The discussions began way back. In 1992, when the UN Conference on Environment and Development in Rio de Janeiro called the Earth Summit, finally explicitly included gender issues in its platform. In 1993, the World Conference on Human Rights held in Vienna recognized the rights of women and girls as an inalienable human right. In 1994, the International Conference on Population and Development held in Cairo focused on stressing the empowerment of women for equitable development. By 1995, the World Summit for Social Development held in Copenhagen took gender equity as a core strategy for social and economic development, environmental protection. Many issues have been discussed over time. Conflict, inequality in the economic and political structures, inequalities between men and women in the sharing of power and decision making, lack of respect for and inadequate promotion and protection of human rights, and gender inequalities, discrimination, and the list goes on and on. Fortunately for us, countries became cognizant of the fact that you should not, as a leader, or a nation, or a government, discriminate between genders. And that you should try in your best way possible to ensure that they are equitably divided so that everyone gets a chance to live and enjoy and participate in the things that make life worth living. Western countries have done better than African countries have. The SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals, came out of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. All of these agendas are set to help us bring people closer together, to become more inclusive, and to ensure that all of us benefit from whatever resources are available. Before you is the 2019 Africa SDG report. And for the first time, the SDG office located in Rwanda decided that it would go out and look at what was happening in terms of gender equity in all of the different areas that we spoke about earlier. And hopefully you can go back to your internet, you'll find this sustainable development report for all of the African nations, including Liberia. It will shock you to know that maybe in Rwanda and one or two other countries, everyone has fallen below the agenda. In fact, there are many countries that don't have any statistics. If you look at the Liberian framework, you will find out that there is a gender officer in each of the ministries and agencies. They are invisible. What they should be doing is gathering statistics on the gender issues, institution by institution, helping to release the reports that will show whether people are progressing or just sitting in one place. These measures are put together by the international community to help nations come up to where they should be. They are very, very, very discouraging. The reason why the gender index sits in the middle of all of these other things is the fact that if you provide an opportunity for a woman to be empowered, to be included, to have a voice raised, 
you empower an entire new generation. Because if she's empowered, she will ensure that there's good education for children. If she's empowered, she will ensure that she lives in a good environment. If she's empowered, she will make sure that her children get safe drinking water. And so by helping this one individual that is the female, you will find out that all of the SDG parameters can be satisfied. So the more women you, you get on board, the better it is for our families. We all know, as we say in the Liberian parlance, that one hair cannot be nice, or that one hair cannot fill a basket. A woman who is empowered is an asset to her community, an asset to her family, and definitely an asset to her husband. The Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing, and we usually leave that out, obtains favor from the Lord. That's God's word. So you can imagine if at that level God is looking at what the combination is like. How does it fit together in a way to make them stronger? Then who are we to continue to ignore the fact that the gender quota that is being requested across the world only makes development, makes nations better. As a result of all of these studies that have done, that have been done, governments and international organizations have been urged to promote the search and dissemination of information on gender disparities. We've been asked to encourage production and dissemination of these specific statistics for development programming, planning, monitoring, and evaluation. The bottom line is that if development policies were to be sustainable, their frameworks must include corrections of existing gender disparities in all areas of governance. To ensure equitable access, power sharing, and inclusive decision making. Why is there a need for ensuring gender equality in education and health and public policy and other areas? Let's look at the educational paradigm. Remember the definition for education. Was the process of, of acquiring knowledge through study, training, or imparting knowledge by way of instructions or any other practical procedure. Gender equality in education is critical. Let's look around us. There is an increasing competitive labor market, fast growing populations, and all kinds of demands as we move in the 21st century. Because of all of these competing demands, there's a constant need for higher levels of education. Clearly, people without the necessary skills and expertise are at a serious disadvantage. This realization has brought in the consensus that education and knowledge is a must, especially in these turbulent and challenging times. And it can be used to quickly move marginalized and excluded people into the mainstream, thus enabling them to contribute their quota to development and remain outside the poverty range. So education in all of its facets, whether it's a traditional learning, whether it's skill training, whether it's, it's learning on a job, everyone must ensure as things change and progress in our world that they are up to par. What I learned 10 years ago as a banker, I'm sure it's quite different from what banking is now. If you would ask me to go and work in a bank, I wouldn't have a clue. Because there are new issues, there are new paradigms, there are new things that people need to consider in decision making in the banks. Liberia, unlike most countries, have a manpower vacuum because as you go from agency to agency, you'll find out that people have gone to school and maybe gotten a master's 20 years ago. And they're still dealing with the same issues 
with the same learning, they are way behind. Then we wonder why is it that Liberia doesn't move forward. If you are learning something from the 1970s, then you are outside of the entire paradigm. And that is why education is an important part of the gender gap because it provides an opportunity once you learn and you are proficient to get online and remain outside of the poverty stream. This figure that I got from Educate a Child talks about education and the gender dimension. I will definitely leave the soft copy so you will have time enough to really look at it. They talk about the direct cost of education, such as fees, clothing, books, and supplies. What is the reality? The reality is if you travel to a remote city in Jawa County, for example, and parents are faced with the issues of how do they send their kids to school, because it's not just about paying tuition, it's about books, it's about transportation, it's about school feeding, it's about water and sanitation, especially for girls. If a family has to look at all of those costs, and they maybe have a limited budget, what is the normal choice in Africa, especially here in West Africa? If the choice has to be made between sending a boy or a girl to school, the boy is usually in precedence. Because somehow our parents think that they are the head of, of, of the household, they'll grow up and become great. True. But they will marry the same daughters that are left on the side. And then you'll hear them say, oh, they won't want to do anything. She just said it in our own place. So you have marginalized the entire family because a decision was taken to send the boy to school as opposed to the girl. The other indirect cost of education, especially if you talk about child protection, if you have a young baby that someone has to take care of. What is that extra cost? Again, girls are disadvantaged. The attitudes and cultural practices, gender, gender stereotyping again, is a cause for early marriage, no status of women, early pregnancy, high level of maternal mortality because some of the young girls who are married at 11 and 10 years, I mean 10, 11 and 12 and 13 years old, have not developed fully, a lot of them will die in childbirth. Of course, there are health and issues to consider and situations to consider in crisis and times of instability. But girls most often are disadvantaged. Health needs. Biologically, you know men and women have different health needs. We have different lifestyles, and we have different socially ascribed roles arising from our social cultural background. But health is also an important gender indicator. Because if a country looks at the benefits of health, then you can consider lifespan. Over the last 10 years, the lifespan of, of people in Liberia, both male and female, has gone up a little bit. During the war, it was a very low amount. Countries must consider lifespan, retirement ages, ability and intellect for certain jobs, family needs, maternity, sick leave, vacations, something that we don't do, but I think it's important for everyone to be able to take some time off and just rest. But in order for governments to plan properly, these are the health indications that they look at. Of course, those who are stronger, those who are able, those who have maybe higher intellect, but they're not strong physically, all of those things are taken into consideration as you look at the gender gap. You must ensure as a government or an organization that wherever the weaknesses of people are buttressed by the strengths of others, so that everyone has a place and no one is left behind. If you look at the workforce, and let's look at the healthcare workforce, physicians and nurses by gender. You come to Africa and you realize that 28% of physicians are female 
and 72% are men. Again, our young people are being processed in a way that makes a young man believe that he can be all he wants to be. Now the women are, are taught to just, you know, just manage. You, you, you'll get married and you'll, you know, you'll live in someone's house and will take care of you. So you have boys going into strong areas. Are girls weaker or less smart? I say no, they're not. Look at what we do in our daily lives. I know going to high school, I have to get up early in the morning if I was the one assigned to the kitchen. I had to make breakfast and lunch. And I started first with just making breakfast and going to school. And then I would come home and have to make lunch. My parents were home from work at four. And I realized that I didn't have enough time. And so I began to get up at three o'clock in the morning, I would make breakfast and I would make, fix the soup. So that by the time I got home from CWA, at 2.30 or 3, all I had left to do was to warm the soup and fix the rice. Of course, that's not all of the work you do. During the day, you are taking care of siblings, making sure your, your mother's issues are resolved, and girls keep running around, running around, trying to solve household issues. Most boys come home from school and they go and play football. <laughs> and they relax. It is R and R which is so important, but girls never get that opportunity. And so when the boys engage one another, they learn teamwork, they learn rules of the game, they learn how to engage one another. While you are at home and your mother will tell you, well, when you get married, you'll be left in your house by yourself, so learn to do things at home. And that is a barrier for women when you get to an area where you need to now be able to collaborate with others. We don't learn that. So that by the time we get to the place where we now need to know how to collaborate, it's very difficult because you've been taught you'll be in your house alone. But the boys are better at it, they will argue about issues and the next day they'll be laughing and clapping hands. Whereas we haven't learned to express our emotions and to just take things in stride so everything is an issue for women. That borders on the health, the mind of women. Are we healthy when you grow up and you're assigned a task at work that includes get gathering women together? You'll find that most times a, a gathering of women ends up in chaos. Whereas the men will have to network and do what they need to do. The whole issue of governance is that countries should also take a look at all of these nuances. A woman who has a baby wants to stay for three months and heal and bond with that baby and take care of that baby. It took a long time before the issue of maternity leave was put in place. There are still some places where if you get pregnant, they just throw you out of work. So women again are marginalized in all of these areas. I think the boys get it a little easy, but again, I must say, that the mothers continue, you know, even though they complain about their husbands, they continue to train their boys in the same way. We train boys to, you know, change your clothes and drop it on the floor. Oh, you have to stop and pick it up. The boys will eat and they will still let it grow, wash your dishes. So we do create the young men that end up marrying our daughters. And then we complain, oh, he can't even pick up his clothes because now you're working as hard as he is. So when you get home, you don't want to pick up after a man. You want him to be able to pick up his clothes, but then you teach your son that we have a circle that's growing that must be ended. And we distinguish between boys and girls. There are few homes where boys will cook and clean. There are few homes where the girls will be allowed to go and play football. Now it's becoming fashionable, but it's still something that parents think about. And so the health factor is very important as we look at the gender needs of both male and female. In the public and policy making spheres, gender inequality and biases are now a prominent feature of policy making. Reports seek to show that disparities and inequalities should be reducing and that in fact those programs are inclusive These new thought processes going into development
sit us in the gender gap. In most instances, however, women continue to be underrepresented at all levels, including in crucial sectors affecting their very lives. If you look at the statistics worldwide, there are only 16 countries in which more than 15% of ministerial posts are held by women. In 59 countries around the world, there are no women ministers at all. Although women have the right to vote in nearly every country in the world, there are places, but they are not in the decision making box. And so they are just mere employees. I don't count them because if you want the positive effect of what we're talking about, women should be in positions of trust. And if you look at this global gender gap reality, you will find out that you know, the men have a smooth sailing. There's a bridge and they're dressed properly and walking around and taking a stroll. Where well, women will go all around, go through homes and valleys. You know, and by the time you step up there, maybe the opportunity that you could have used uh, to become an impactful person has already passed. Maybe by the time you get there, you're in your 60s or 70s and are wondering what it is that you can do. But let me tell you a small story. A few months ago, I was invited to participate in a graduation ceremony in a place in Bonn County, which had one female out of, out of about 16 persons. So 15 men and one female. And I was wondering why at that level we had a young woman. And so we gave her a chance to speak. And she spoke about the fact that she had longed to be a nurse. And that was her passion. That was her calling. But she was stuck in a village far away from schools more than ninth grade level. And so when she finished her ninth grade, just sat home, knowing in her mind that her goals and her ambitions may never be realized. In our discussions as community leaders, we decided that we should put a high school in that same environment. And once the high school was built, this lady, though she had all of her children, aging lady decided that she would go back to school. And she went back to school, passed the wax, and graduated twelfth grade. When we asked her how old she was, she laughed sadly and said that she was 60 years old. Mm -hmm. On being asked, so you finished high school, what do you want to be? And she sadly said, I wish. I will still be a nurse. But if you consider all of what it takes to be a nurse, at 60 years old when you should be talking and thinking about retiring, she knew that it was just a dream. But this is the reality of women across Africa. That most times we have to put our dreams and our aspirations aside. We do it in the family setting because the boys must be given greater access. We do it when we get married because we are supposed to support our husbands. If we don't have husbands, we put aside our dreams and our ambitions because we must raise our children. These are glaring realities. How then does a country that desires growth and development fix this issue? Only through political participation, the legislature is the best place because the decisions are taken there and it affects every aspect of our life. We have persistent harassment of women, violence in politics, and the list goes on and on. Though there are increasing numbers of female participation just a little more, the spheres of politics is still left to the male figure. 
If you look at the national legislature today, there is one female senator in the Senate. In the House, of, out of 73 members, there are about eight or nine. They usually call them noise makers. Because democracy has its shortcomings. And it is the tyranny of the majority. Because once the men get together, whatever they decide is an issue. Because in the end, you must vote. If we have very small numbers, how do you even get your point across? While you are speaking, they are making noise and doing things as if what you are saying is not important. And so in today's development, gender has to be considered. These are some of the reasons why, minus the emotion that we feel as women. Gender allows for a clear analysis which helps to identify, understand, and redress inequities based on gender development initiatives. It enables enhanced social and economic impact for development. Gender issues increase possibilities for, success, for successful action in development interventions. Gender allows for a more efficient use of resources in development because you have four hands instead of just two. Gender enables development practitioners to determine the behavior and actions of women and men in developing interventions for Good governance. Gender helps to understand the relationships between men and women in development in terms of power relations. And that's a whole topic by itself. Because the power in any family is usually given to the boy. And the girls are asked to just wait. Well, now you have a husband, that is the first. Even if you are older, if you are married, if you are more educated, Somehow, African families think that the boys have a better answer to the questions that they face. And gender gaps help us to understand what these power relations are. How can we use them in decision making, in control of resources and income in households? And this is the real issue. Because the power relations in the legislature or in the executive shows that the men actually hold the strength to power. If you look at our budget, you'll find out that we talk about maternal mortality. And look at what's in the budget for maternal mortality. It just shows you that it's just maybe money enough for one or two meetings. It does not address the issue of maternal mortality. Who are those concerned about maternal mortality? There's a woman who is in the childbearing age that is in a village far away from where the clinic is and doesn't go to the hospital during the nine months that she's pregnant because she has no money in the end die in childbirth because the nurses do not know what is true. These power relations determine where funds are placed are we ensuring, for example, that girls, in order to lift up the gap, have a little bit easier time in, in their education? Are there specific programs that provide an opportunity for girls as opposed to the boys? And the boys have a way of moving around, older boys or older men, and they will get their fees. Nine times out of 10, they're not harassed. Whereas the woman on the other side, Try going to ask for fees for a wire. And I'm happy that in the midst of everything that we're going through, the wire fees or wax fees have been removed from the neck of girls. Because they will model around, go and visit places that they normally would not. And you can just imagine some of the things that happen to them just because they want an education. If you're in politics, we've been arguing about putting in place specific seats for women so that their voices are not cut off. And I've never been more discouraged or disappointed as I was for the last few weeks. 
when I heard the male police say, look how strong you are. Why do you want gender equity quotients brought about in our country? And I stopped one of them and I said, do you know how I got elected in 2005? Oh, women, I won't fight for it too. I said, that is not the issue. And really, that is not the issue. Because women have more stamina than the men, I can tell you that. Look at the war. What it took for women to hide their husbands and their sons and to go out in difficult places and bring food without any fear. So it's not about getting in a race and fighting. It's not. It's about opportunities that are available. And so I said to him, I've said this over the last 12 years, that in 2005, the Election Commission had a gender equity part of their bill, of their laws, and they said that political parties should ensure that they had a minimum of 30% in the structure of their parties, but that in the list case that they would present for those that went to elections, we have a minimum of 30%. Of course, nobody paid attention to the 30% at the administrative level. But they said all real listings. Now I've gone to, you know, ask them about to run on a party on a ticket of the MPP. And I was shut down. Oh, I said, I mean, where you going? Where you left you? <laughs> and so in my frustration, I said, well, maybe it's not the right time. I went aside. Fortunately for us, people were looking at that general photo. And so every political party that submitted listings of all male candidates were sent back. Opportunity. And then they decided, oh, we have to get rid of some of the men and bring the women on board. And when I do it, I almost said, oh, wow, I like that I need that, she's not going win. And so they kept the papers to the latest moment. I was called maybe a week to the deadline. So, you want to be senator? Just put a new name paper you want to All it took was that small opportunity. And so instead of following me, I'm part of a political party in the field. I was left alone. Most times women are left alone. And even when you reach the pinnacle of your career, you're left alone even more. People ask me, what she doing? I said, this is a man's thing. Why is she even there? And so the affirmative actions that we are clamoring for is important. Because if you have an all-male political party structure, and then they say, well, without women, they need a women win. They are the cooks, they are the cleaners, they are the ones who go ahead, clean the fans, and make sure things are okay. They're never at the table when the discussions are being held. Or that they draw for the women win. It takes women at the different levels to say, wait, you know, this is a good idea, but how do we factor in? And so if a woman is not at that table, you'd be surprised to find out that her voice is not even considered. Very rarely, and you know, we have these new he for she champions that are moving around and masquerading because some of them think they'll get a benefit for it. And it's not real. And they say it because they think it's the in thing to do. But when the issues are on the table and it's time to stand up and say, yes, I believe in this, you'd be surprised how many of them even sign. A few weeks ago, as we considered the amendments to the Constitution as proposals, and one of them said, oh, you, you're too harsh. I said, this is about the life of our country. It's not about me. I've always gone to the pinnacle of my career. I don't want to be senator or representative, but I want more women in the legislature so the issues that are important to women become issues of discussion and implementation on the table where those decisions are made. A gender gap allows for prioritization of development initiatives. Can you imagine if I had not built that school in that community I wish the 60 year old woman had gone to school. She would have died unfulfilled. But that is the issue across our country. You might go and see a situation of, of why the well is 30 minutes from the town. Why are you building wealth 
20 minutes from the town. Who's walking? Not the man. They want to treat playing checkers, drinking beer. <laughs> and there's the women who walk in the morning and bring water. The women who walk in the evening to make sure they have food and water for their families. And you can imagine the risks that they take just ensuring. So who is this gender? Who is this national development person who decides that the well will be 15 minutes from the town? Well, it could have been right in the center and made it easy. These are some of the issues we talk about. Is it something that they think about? Maybe not. Maybe they don't consider the strides that women go through just to become successful or to make it easier for them. All you know is you come from the farm and there's water to wash your hands and your feet and your face. And you eat your food, you need to go there. And the water finish, you go back and then move your water and bring it back. These issues cannot be under or more over emphasized. The gender gap mitigates unforeseen challenges and obstacles in development interventions. So you will know if you're a woman and a school needs to be built, that the school needs to be near the town. Why are you putting a major school that young children will walk? If you, if you go to Bunk County and that's a place I know well off the back of my hand, you'll find out that the schools are always far away. And so the mother will say, okay, the boys are stronger, let them walk. But by the time the girl gets to an age where the mother can trust her to walk with the boys, she's lost so much. And she's going to grow up with that. Gender reduces the dependency ratio in societies. It allows for affirmative action if people are proactive, and most importantly, it allows for equality. Gender analysis help build capacity and commitment to the equality that we seek, that is so important as nations or communities or organizations. As I close, Sustainable development must extend to all aspects of both male and female. Human security, whether environment, economic, social, cultural, or personal, must demand that priorities under the development goals and approaches are addressed, that they are integrated in the development frameworks and promoted, especially in policies related to education health, development, and politics. This consideration is based on three strategic principles. One of university, university promotion and respect for universal freedoms and rights. Diversity, ensuring the respect for the different views of others, and ensuring participation that both male and female come to the table and bring their very best. Let me close by leaving you with words of President Paul Kigami, a gender activist, not just in words, but also in deeds. He said, and I quote, women can contribute more to society when enjoying their full rights. They can deliver more when they are enjoying but men and women working together, using their talents to the maximum, the effect is a multiplier effect. All of society benefits. As we learned in arithmetic class, the sum of both genders is indeed much greater than the parts. Thank you so much. I'm a student of this graduate school on the international development class. Now, your quest to get more female participation in the legislature, I want you to please uh, tell us, just for the sake of this lecture series, what you think would be the best way to do that.
maybe in 2005 when Adam Saliba elected, saying that the Constitution said he, they might have had a place to stand. So we've tried everything from the beginning to the end. This was like a last ditch effort. But I think what we will begin to do is to collaborate, raise funds, and go out in the field. And inform women why it is important to have a female voice. Sometimes people forget the importance of having a voice. It's not about what the men do, you know, they will go out and, and pay for your daughters and, and do all kinds of things. Women don't pay that kind of money. They will build wells, they will put books into schools, uh, they will make sure uh, children are okay. But the women will ask you, so where you grow up? And so I told a group of them one day that the fact that I didn't pay for you to get me elected, my mind is always on Bond County until it's at the annoyance of some. Is it everything about Bond County? I said, because I didn't pay for that vote. They gave it to me freely. And so if I still have things that I have not yet accomplished, I must make sure that I complete it. So we must go out, remind women why it is important. Because the truth of the matter is that we make up 50 or 49% of the votes. And the women of Liberia could determine that the 15 senators going out in 2020 will be all women. Yes, we can. I'm sure everything that you spoke was on the mind of every woman in this room. Our ratio, men to women, is another proof of gender struggle that we go through. Each woman, I'm sure that some sacrifice she had to make to be here today. My question is, as men, they grow up, they start to, to connect from a very younger age. Women do not have that support system. So is it possible that we can start to connect within our civil status, social status, to start to build one another up? Because we do not know that as women, we just fight and get our own. But it has to be a collective thing, women, we build each other. Be there for your sister, be your sister keeper as well. Is it possible to create that network? And you'll find that when women get together and you know, do that and the kid is funny, but it's not. And there were five sitting and talking, they will gossip about somebody else. By the time one person leaves that group, then they gossip to her. You know, and then you know, I don't know how to do it. So it builds a level of, of mistrust amongst us. You know, someone visits your room and next thing they're sleeping with your husband. You know, there's a lot that goes on in the female community which causes this level of mistrust. But the truth of the matter is, if we must attain the heights that we need to be able to influence the policies and programs that we want to see, then we too have to change our attitudes. We must begin to befriend one another in earnest. Because I can't smile and tell you, oh, you know, your best friend was talking about him, I hope I change this. And sometimes as a politician, I like dealing with people I don't know because they're not in my space. So I can go and engage them and I leave. I don't owe them anything, they don't owe me anything. But when you come home and you're in your space and you get a little bit more weary, you know, who's watching, who's wanting you to call? And I think that can be changed. Then we need to begin to teach it to our daughters and to teach it to our sons so that they accept the fact that two are better than one. And mind you, the effort of women is not to step ahead. It's not. God they didn't take us from the head of the man or from his foot. He took us from his side. He wanted us to be partners. And I think that is possible. We have to keep talking. We have to keep. People must see, you know, that we're serious about it. We begin to grow a camaraderie that can help. That camaraderie took place in 2005. Or else Madam Ellen Johnson said it would have never gotten elected. Everybody forgot where they were from which party they were from and what county they belong to. There was a message sent across the country that it's time for a female president. And so people would say, okay, I'm in this party, you go to the ballot box and check and say, that's what we did. If they hadn't done that, she wouldn't have gotten elected. So it's so possible. A lot of work though. And I think if we keep working, hopefully we'll achieve that sooner in the age. What's your position on the 
I believe no one should be left behind. And that is the bottom line of development activities across the world. And that is why the gender gap is important. Because people are looking for ways to ensure equity and to ensure that some groupings that are disadvantaged are not left behind. And that is the responsibility of all of us. As much as I work, I have an NGO that provides education and mentoring for little girls. I have over 2,000 little girls across Liberia. That is my quota. If every woman who had a job would just look in a neighborhood and find out how they can help the little girls that are running around, mentor them. You don't have to take 2,000 girls, just one. Before you look, the situation concerning quality education that we actually need because of all of the changing tides will be there. But there are some girls in the schools that, and, and you tell them to go take physics and, and, and biology, everybody run away. You know, and I got a problem with girls who think it's an easier route. You must follow the trend in your country. Where are the jobs? If you're going to get involved in the process of learning for four years, something with which you cannot find a job then you have disadvantaged yourself. And really you waste that money and time because you may not find jobs in those areas. And I'll say it, I've said it in many places and people get upset. The truth of the matter is if you do a sociology degree, you need a second degree. So why not take something as a major and do sociology as a minor, you get two for both worlds. But if you get a degree in sociology, where are you going to work? And most of the girls think it's easy but where is the trajectory of the job market? Mining, engineering, agriculture, and we need more of that and say, okay, let's go on. If in your mind, you think, okay, you just get married and sit. But like I said, these two hands are still a basket. So I think this is something that we must think about because they are very critical issues. I always tell my daughter that I'm EBC and one before computers. And I will work at night at 2 o'clock in the morning. I say, I can't think of it, you can't make it for me. You should be laughing because they are the internet generation. Whereas, you know, I, I'm used to writing on paper and pen. They took someone by me an iPad for me to actually sit and learn how to type on a computerized object. I would write all my speeches on the iPad. I am. Because that's the way I learned. But if you have an assignment to do at work, you see somebody can look for your rest on the phone. 25 times to get it right, whereas we get the only computer and fix it, and everything is set up. So I think we must look at all of these new traits. The second question I think was, uh, okay. what's your opinion? And like I said, we're being an academic center, so I hope I can speak to you. The feminist movement is, is something that is going across the world. Because women are looking for greater access. But it's not just about that movement. You know, we gather together, we talk, and we discuss issues. Are we impacting our communities? And I think if the feminist movement was go beyond our generation, then we must turn around and impact and mentor other girls. So that it becomes a way of life. Some of the young women believe that the whole gender issue is not important. In fact, I you know I'm smart, I'll just go get a job. It's not that easy. The fact is a young man can walk into an office and show his resume, and show his grades, and if he's done well, who can hire him? I don't want to begin to talk about what it is. Everyone has felt it at one point in the world. You are frustrated. You can work for something else. There's a video on uh, YouTube showing major universities in Nigeria and Ghana showing serious professors yes, that have been in a business of harassing girls. I didn't see any boys on the video. I didn't see any woman harassing them for sex. But if you watch that video, you will get, get a glimpse of what women feel, how they are marginalized how they are not protected, even as you're trying to get an education. Forget it when you get to the highest level. That's a topic for another day. 
My question is, in a society like Liberia, you follow your, your deliberation and you talk about how critical education is in gender equality or gender issues. In a society like Liberia, the question is, should we concentrate now on equality, gender equality, or on empowerment of women? Because my question is from the point that even if the opportunities are given now in Liberia, there will not be more women that will compete with our male counterparts. Thank you. We always say that women are multifaceted. So she can be young people, and she can be cooking, and she can be pressing her clothes, she can be taking care of her baby. So we know how to do many things at the same time. Somehow that's a gift. If a man is watching football, don't even ask any question. But a woman is able to do a lot. And I'm just saying that to show you that we must use all of what we have to get to where we want to get. The modes of education is changing around the world. What I learned as an economist in 1984 graduating from the University of Liberia is probably moot because they have new paradigms. Education is critical. And when I got elected, I had two masters, one in banking and one in finance. But I go in and I get elected as senator of Bonn County. And I go to my office and I sit to my desk and I wonder what am I supposed to do? I have no clue. Yeah, you get elected, but what is it? Fortunately, we had some NGOs that began to teach us about the role of representation. It's not paying school fees and paying for hospital bills and building people houses. It's not it. It's having your voice raised in an environment where it brings benefit to the community as a whole. And even that is skewed in people's minds. When you get elected, somebody can say, oh, I think a visit or whatever, I, I, I don't have any money to pay on the way back. You don't pay them to you find it anyway. But the fact of the matter is, women must ensure that they have all of these things going on at the same time. If, and that's a serious possibility, that, you know, 2020 might come and go, and in like this city, we're going to have a local one. Serious possibility. Because even now, as you look at the political sphere, I don't see anyone. No one is saying I'm going from Grand Pool or Grand Gide. Nobody. All the women sitting. They'll wait till six months to time. It's okay to get in the race. They're not going to win. Because there is a process. The men are already all in all the bushes. You know, how can I do this? This is the time of the year. And so what you tell us, no, you have to work towards achieving these goals. But the negative part of it is if it ends up being like that, then we have a problem. Because the issues that concern women are quite different from the issues that concern men. And maybe that's how God placed it. That's why he said, Woman will be a top mate. So that together the issues of the family are settled. You know how many single family rooms we have across our country? Many, 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 many. We are not working, coming in late hours. What are the children learning? So I think we must find a way in this talk, find a formula where we can do all of it. We need to ensure that there are women in positions. So that the issues that we are concerned about, you can imagine half of the population in Liberia will be silenced if there is no woman in the Liberian legislature. And so it has many negative effects. How can we get our brothers to understand the issues? How can we get them to believe that it's about partnership which makes for better governance? How can we allow them to change their minds a little bit and just allow us? You know, before I end this question, I went to visit Rwanda. And it seems as if it is so ingrained in the hearts and minds of the Rwandans that anywhere you see a man first, it's like an automatic woman. No fuss. People just fall in line. And so I took some of the hard haired uh, legislators who said, it's gender equity, you're just playing with it. So I said, let's go visit Rwanda. 
And they had the boss of Acts, the speaker of the one in parliament who was a male. How do you guys manage to bring money with your board? And the man laughed. He said, Who's your first teacher? He said, You just talk about it in those terms. Even if your mother is illiterate, she can't read and write. There's so many things she will teach you. And then she can't read and write, she will find somebody, she will pay for that person to teach you. So, who's your first teacher? Who makes you? the individuals that we all have become. Is that mother? The boys will tell you, you know, sometimes they have difficulties in growing up. The mother never gives up. The father will get frustrated and say, I'm going to say it. The mother will keep running him, keep talking, keep, keep petting him until he gets out of the difficulties. So if a woman who is your mother can do all of this, why are you closing up the political space? All she can do is bring more and better to the table under which we can develop in the past. Thank you very much. Our graduate students, you can find us. Madam Vice President, thank you for the, for the nice presentation. I find it very educative and informative. My question concerns data equity in education. The premise to my question is, in our daily life in Nigeria today, we see most of our daughters get pregnant or condition that makes them to drop out of school. Hence, it makes them a qualified to hold positions to compete with us men. My question, what exoteric measure or policy does the government intend to put in place to prevent our daughters to get to pregnant while in school and help us to achieve the end Challenged 
to do more and to do better. My mother just said, show me your friends and I'll show you your. If you have a group of friends that just want to drink beer and have fun, then you have to decide whether drinking beer and not going to school is what you want. In the end, each of us determine where we go, how far we climb, what we are prepared to do, whether good or bad. And then in the end, you have no one else to blame for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think that question is a social question. I don't think government can legislate one pregnancy. Mm -hmm. they, say, <laughs> they say they should get pregnant while they're in high school, but then there's a place where they have night school. That's why the women don't just let be left off because what will happen before is that you be left off. What time you go back to school? And your mom will tell you, you better be looking for a way to put your time to school, your time give you. So for those decisions, by the women themselves as we all scramble for the few opportunities that are available to meet our people. Yeah, one last one.
just empty garbage there. That's socially bankrupt character. But this is our attitude. Mm -hmm. And when we go outside of the country and we, mm -hmm. we travel on the field, get to Ghana, you don't even pay us a chow chicken on the ground. So it's not that we don't know better. But there's something that happens when we come home. And we think that the government is supposed to come and pack up gas or pick your house. When I was growing up, there was men for Palestine. Houses were being picked up for Christmas. People were cleaning up and moving all of the old cars. Because parents loved the Liberia that we had. Today, unfortunately, most of our young people only want to see what's outside. And they think that it's better there. You go and watch the TV because you can't have any quality in our country. It's another form of slavery, but it's voluntary slavery. And so we wish to see that what's outside is better than what we have. My mother would tell me, oh, you're looking at the grass across the fence in your friend's yard. If you walk on your grass, it can become just as green. And so my final message to you as young leaders is what can you do wherever you are? For government is just a small engine, 60,000 people working government. There's a whole sphere of everything happening in private sector investment. People take loans from the bank, they don't pay, they run away. So that when the person who really needs them come, they say, hey, your friend has stole the money, can't give it to you. There's a whole thing going on, mommy, about the corrupt nature of our minds. And each of us must determine that you do the right thing. And I know they will call you names, they call me names. Oh, I can't do so that, so I'm not going to do that. It's not even just about giving. Bravo. I'm not perfect. I have my short forms, but I get up every day and I try to do something good. Because that is what is expected of patriotic citizens. And I think if each of us get up every day and look around and do what we must, before you know it, Liberia will be the Liberia that you want for your children. Let each of us work to make Liberia better and not better. Thank you so much.